clinical trials are come in various phases and forms, and I think it's important that people understand the purpose of each type of clinical trial. When you're talking about a new therapy or new drug, uh, they always have undergone what we call preclinical testing in cell culture with animals. But when you get to humans, because animals are not humans, we have to test it in humans. And so the first in human trials are what we call phase one trials. And phase one trials can be done in healthy, normal individuals to find out what's a safe dose, or they can be done in patients that have very advanced disease, though we hope they may have some benefit from these types of drugs and these new therapies. The goal of the trial is to just find a safe dose to study further. Then it goes to phase two, and phase two is to take that safe dose and determine if it is effective in any particular disease. Other types of phase two are drugs that we use for other indications, but may be using them for a new indication such as a histiocytosis type disease. The phase three trial is really when we try to determine if that new therapy or that new drug is better than our standard of care. And that's often done in a randomized uh, fashion where half of the patients will get the standard of care and half will get the new drug. Then there's another type of clinical trial which they call a phase four and that's after the FDA has approved the drug for that indication and you collect data to make sure that there aren't any other unexpected toxicities uh, in a bigger uh, and larger population. A lot of what is done in the Histiocyte Society and the uh, Histiocyte Association are some funding for the preclinical trials for new drugs but most of them are the phase two and phase three to really determine are they uh, effective in histiocytosis and other types of diseases that we're interested in. Uh, clinical trials, I think, uh, are something that people don't really understand. It is really our only way that we can make advances uh, in the treatment of any disease, but particularly rare diseases like the histiocytosis. To give you an example, in the 1970s, the survival rate for HLH was less than 10%. And we've ran two clinical trials through the Histiocyte Society, and now 60 to 70% of children with HLH are, per, are expected to survive. And it was only through clinical trials. The same could be said for LCH. I think the LCH points out another important part of clinical trials. Before we were doing uh, clinical trials, the patients that we now know are low risk were treated the same and they survived, but what we have found out is, is that they also had some unfortunate long-term side effects from the treatment. So not only are we trying to get patients to survive, but we're trying to get them to survive with the highest quality of life. And in the high risk group of patients with LCH, we've been able to get the survival rates from 20 or 30 percent to now 70 to 80 percent uh, with new therapies. So it's only through clinical trials that we're able to really improve the outcome for uh, human disease and in this case for kids with uh, histiocytosis. One of the questions that we're often asked, especially uh, from parents and parent group uh, and parents associations and advocacy groups, is, is that clinical trials are research. And it, if it's your child, it's somewhat unsettling to think about having your child be experimented on. The thing with clinical trials are, as I said before, they're very important in our advancing our knowledge and the outcome of the diseases. What I do is spend some time with parents to make them feel more comfortable about allowing their child to be part of research. We have many different types of um, safety mechanisms. Uh, when any clinical trial, we have experts that design the clinical trial. It goes through a lot of review to make sure we're asking the most appropriate question. That the design is, gives us the highest probability of getting an answer and trying to improve the outcome. Once the clinical trial has been finalized, it has to go to ethics boards. And these are an independent group of people who determine that the potential benefit from the trial outweighs the potential risk. Now that may be, it's not without risk, and every individual has risk, 
but that is also where each individual investigator has to sit down with a parent and go over the clinical trial and explain the potential benefits, but also the potential risks, the potential complications, and they must sign a informed consent before they can go on to the clinical trial. Additionally, most clinical trials have what we call a data safety monitoring board. And this is a small group of people who have an expertise not only in clinical trials, but also in the disease uh, that the uh, subjects have. And what they do is they monitor the trial as it's going on to make sure that, for instance, one arm of the study is not doing worse or having more toxicity, which would mean that you would have to stop the study early because the risks are outweigh the benefits. On the other side, if one arm of the trial is doing much better, it would be unethical to continue to have people on the inferior outcome arm and so that the Data Safety Monitoring Board will stop it so that the patients can, all patients can be on the arm that has the best outcome. So there are many uh, checks and balances uh, that go on throughout the entire trial to make sure that we're first doing no harm and making sure that the patients, the, most of the patients can have uh, benefit from any therapy or not be receiving inferior uh, therapy. The current era that we have or we're in presents many challenges for performing clinical trials, especially in diseases like the histiocytosis. First of all, with rare diseases, you have to have a certain number of patients to be able to answer questions. And to do that with rare diseases, you have to have many different centers and often many different countries agree to participate in a clinical trial. When you go across many centers and when you go across many countries, each country has different rules about regulation and this makes it difficult to get everybody to agree and, and uh, play well together. But also in this day and age, funding is a real issue. Clinical trials and clinical research costs more than just giving care to patients. So the question is who's going to pay for that extra time from nurses and physicians to have spent time going over the trial, getting consent, uh, getting extra blood, performing extra procedures that would not be part of standard of care. Also there needs to be money to supply extra tests to try to figure out at the end of the day who did well and who did not and why so that we can learn more about which therapies are best for individual patients, as well as there's cost involved with data collection, data analysis, and data reporting. Now, many people feel that pharma, pharma companies should pay for this if they are going to benefit from having a new drug approved for a certain indication, but they don't want to pay for all of the costs of care. The uh, hospitals do not have the ability to pay for the nurses and doctors' time that spent extra on clinical trials, and now many governments don't have the money to support that. So we really are depending on a little bit from everybody, and this is where philanthropy and certainly uh, parent uh, and advocacy groups can put pressure on governments and pharma com companies and hospitals that these are very, very important. This is the only way we're making progress and to emphasize to them why this is so necessary and we have to find ways to fund them. We are currently working as well with trying to work with different countries about having common elements as far as ethical board review and regulations so that it is easier for people in all these various countries to be able to, in a more rapid fashion, open the study and enroll patients within their country so that we can get these trials done quicker, learn things quicker, and make the outcome for patients better, faster than we are currently. I think one of the um, problems and barriers we also have is, is that many uh, physicians now especially in rare diseases, um, 
don't want to go through the necessary time and commitment to open a trial at their particular center for a few patients they might see once a year or twice a year. Um, and sometimes the physicians don't know enough about the diseases to feel comfortable uh, running or opening a clinical trial. They would prefer to do what is considered standard of care. But I think parents can be a great advocate for their child to put pressure on their treating physician to either enroll their child on a clinical trial or to send them to a center where the trial is open. We've known for many, many years, at least in cancer, that the patients that are on clinical trials, for numerous reasons, and we don't know for sure all of them, but the patients that go on clinical trials have a better outcome than those that receive standard of care. And like I said, I don't know, and I'm not going to speculate on why that may be, but it is a reproducible fact that comes out over and over again. And I think that's something that the parents can be a true advocate for their child to say that they want them to be on clinical trial, not only for their child, but also for other children in the future that are afflicted by these very rare but very life-threatening uh, illnesses. So as I said, one of the problems is with rare diseases is, is that many uh, physicians that first encounter a child with a diagnosis such as a histiocytosis, they may not be familiar uh, with the disease, with the diagnosis, or with the treatment. And so again, parents can be a great advocate. Um, but I think now with the communication tools that we have through the internet, and um, more readily available communication with experts, that it's really up to the parents to talk to parent uh, advocacy uh, associations, get on the website. They have these advocacy, advocacy groups, have expert contacts that can put the, not only the parent, but also the treating physician in contact with experts, because sometimes I'll be quite frank, it's Physicians have a feeling that they would rather talk to another physician than just a parent about what is necessary for the treatment of their child. And so these advocacy groups are very good at putting uh, in contact experts in the disease with treating physicians to help them and guide them through what would be the best as far as diagnosis and treatment uh, for their child. Some people can travel to where the experts are, some cannot. So I think these groups and with the communication and social networking that we've done and professional networking that we have done, this has been a great advancement for the treatment of kids with rare diseases such as the histiocytosis.